So uh, welcome everyone to the Consciousness and Reality Colloquium series. This is the inaugural lecture for this academic year. And uh, we have participants today from Caltech, MIT and Stanford. So welcome everyone. I am Kunal Mule, an astrophysicist and the co-founder of iMix, which is the Institute for Mind, Intelligence and Consciousness Studies. Uh, this colloquium series seeks to inspire interdisciplinary investigations on topics such as the mind, cognition, consciousness, and the nature of reality. Uh, the nature of consciousness and reality, of course, have been pondered by humans since many centuries. And in his book, The Shadows of the Mind, Roger Penrose argued that human consciousness is non-algorithmic and that quantum mechanics or quantum gravity must play an essential role in understanding consciousness. On the other hand, philosopher Edwin Bryant from Rutgers published a paper a few years ago on Eastern metaphysics, uh, specifically coming from the Sankhya school of philosophy, which seems to suggest that gross perceivable matter is a densification of subtler matter, or in short, uh, that matter is made up of mind stuff, seems uh, quite far out. In any case, uh, Lee Smolin's topic today, which is quantum cosmology and the role of qualia, is of great interest for from both the current scientific explorations on consciousness and reality, as well as from the perspectives of these Eastern meditative and introspective traditions. Uh, so just some quick logistics before we introduce the speaker. Uh, selected questions from the Q&A box will be taken after the talk. So I encourage all of you to submit your questions through the Q&A button that you can see at the bottom of the Zoom window. Um, and just to make this more interactive and much more fun, uh, of course, Lee's talk is going to be a lot of fun, I'm expecting, but uh, in order to make this more fun, you can click on the poll button below to answer two simple questions, yes or no questions. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to the polls uh, button on the bottom and launch this particular poll, okay? So I hope that you're able to see this at the bottom of your screens, uh, the poll window, which will get you to two questions, which you can answer a simple yes or no. One is, could qualia and consciousness be playing a role on quantum scales? And the second question is, do we need consciousness to play a role at the beginning of the universe? All right, so uh, seems simple enough, uh, yes or no. I will announce the results of the poll at the end of the talk. Okay, and with this, I will request Dr. Christoph Koch to please introduce our speaker, Lee Smolin. Thank you very much, uh, Kunal. I'm Christoph Koch. I used to be for 25 years a Caltech professor. And since uh, I moved away from Caltech and I'm now here in Seattle at the Allen Institute, um, today I have the pleasure to introduce Lee Smolin, who is a member um, of the Perimeter Institute for Theoretical Physics in uh, in uh, Ontario, close to Waterloo, where he's also at University of Waterloo, a professor of, an adjunct professor of physics. As well, uh, given his philosophical interests, he's a faculty of the philosophy department at the University of Toronto. I first. Uh, encountered uh, Lee through his book, um, a very well received 2006 book, The Trouble with Physics, where he criticized string theory as a, as a viable scientific um, uh, theory. His contributions are mainly quantum gravity, in particular the approach known as uh, loop uh, quantum gravity. Now, he also advocates, which is relevant to today's talk, an alternative view of space and time that he calls uh, temporal naturalism, which is the topic of today's talk, and that he uh, I encountered in his book, Time Reborn, where I also first noticed where he made some really interesting trenchant observation on the nature of consciousness in the in the appendix of the book and its intersection with fundamental physics. Just before the pandemic struck, he published on archive a paper on the place of qualia in a relational universe. So uh, I very much look forward to Lee's talk. Please take it away, Lee. Okay, thank you. Yes, we're going to say that. Well, thank you very, very much. It's very humbling to be here and talk about this very imposing topic. Let me just say at the beginning, 
a big thanks to, unfortunately, Pastor Mansley, Jim George, who is a person who encouraged me every time we met to, to investigate the question of consciousness in physics. And it's only for Jim that I would have done so. So those of you who know who he is, know who he is. Um, what I want to start with is talk about an approach to unifying quantum mechanics and general relativity, which sometimes we call quantum gravity. I'm going to emphasize that any sensible approach to quantum gravity has to, in fact, be a cosmological theory. So there's, a, there's an importance to quantum cosmology, which needs to be stressed and understood. And that will be the first part of the talk, how we are believe we have accomplished that. Um, when we talk about temporal naturalism, well, the subtitle of the seminar here is Does Temporal Naturalism Have a Future? And of course, that's a joke because there is no future in temporal naturalism. So let me also thank Cecilia Verde, Roberto Mangiber, under Marina Cosas, Cortez, um, as people among the people, but the people who absolutely most importantly stimulated these ideas in their development. Okay. Um, we are not able to, can, you, can we lose that, that bar across the top? And, oh, there, okay, can you see? Can everybody see we just switched? Okay, I'll take it if you do. So the way that I try to do physics is a little bit insane. Yes, seems, yes, we can see it. It seems to get me somewhere. Um, is to try to take on all the deep problems at once. It's it's a little bit scary to do so, but it turns out that the gauge theories are closely related to the standard model, and those are both closely related to cosmology and so forth. So I end up thinking about these, these issues simultaneously, and they get me, well, they got me originally to loop quantum gravity, which is not going to play a very large role, but it's always in the background. It got me then to two ideas I've been investigating over the last decade, and they're first the idea that the laws of nature are not static, are not fixed, but evolve in time, and the universe, in a sense, makes itself as it evolves in time. And the other idea is an example of that called energetic causal sets, which is I'll be explaining it in some detail, but it's a form of a possible quantum gravity theory. Okay. Um, where we're going, if you lose track, is to this insight. And the insight is that all the things that are what we call observables in quantum theory represent partial views of the rest of the universe. So the universe is nothing but a large number of these views of other parts of the universe, which exist briefly and make up what we call the present. These presents create and influence each other as they explore the different ways that the universe can be. So we actually have a theory that realizes this way of thinking about cosmology. And to me, it's essential. You're not getting anywhere in cosmology unless you're confronting the question of why these laws, why not other laws? And there's no interesting way to in, in attack such questions than thinking of the laws as the product of some revolutionary process. And that's not my idea. That goes back into the 19th century to a number of philosophers. But it's a key idea. Okay. So rough is rough um, outline. Well, this is the introduction. I'm going to then explain to you one approach to quantum gravity and quantum cosmology, which we call energetic causal sets, as I mentioned. This is an approach in which there is no space originally, and there is no space-time. There is time, time acting in a passive mode. To Time is basically the process by which events cause other events to occur in the future. We are able, however, to see how space, that is events making up a space, emerge lawfully 
or almost lawfully from these rules that we get when we describe energetic causal effects. We'll describe how quanta emerge, and the quanta will have to be split up into two kinds of quanta, boring quanta and interesting puzzling quanta. And these correspond to different uh, different parts of quantum mechanics. Our quantum mechanics teacher has always told us about rule one, which is evolution by the Schrodinger equation, and rule two, which is something mysterious that takes place in measurement. So we're going to maintain that this division of events is fundamental. And the two versions of quantum mechanics, rule one, rule two, the boring part, which is the lawful part, um, gives us ordinary quantum mechanics. And the surprising part, where the laws are evolving themselves, has to do with the parts that become quantum measurements and so forth. So we always have, and I take, I'm a realist, I should emphasize. So this split I'm taking to be real, what we are looking at when we're looking at quantum mechanics is two theories and two ways that change can happen. And there is where we'll find qualia. Okay, so prelude, if you go all the way back to the beginning, and this is something that my collaborator, Claudio Verde, began talking about. Um, suppose the world is based ultimately on one distinction, the distinction between definite and indefinite. So there are observables in parts of the world where they have definite values at some time, and there are parts that don't. And basically, a quantum measurement or a move in quantum mechanics is any action towards the future which takes indefinite states, states that in quantum mechanics would be called mixed states to definite states. And we'll see how that dynamic plays in. Okay. Um, so um, I think I'm giving you a bit too much introduction. So let me keep going. Um, so this is what we call, well, let me start by just saying, we're going to start by talking about the dynamics before we talk about the kinematics, which is backwards to how we usually do it. So we first ask, what is real and fundamental in my universe? So I have a cosmology. I have events in it. Events are real. Events are fundamental. But there are momentary. Events are only momentary. There's no such thing as an event sitting there looking out at the world saying, when is somebody going to talk to me? An event is a step in the conversation and no more. So uh, events exist, the time, time exists as the change of the world brought about from event to event and everything else is emergent. Uh, everything else except, I, I should add, uh, momentum and energy and we'll see where that comes in. The description of the world in terms of sets of events and the relationships between them and nothing else was brought about by Raphael um, I'll, I'll get his name in a minute Raphael but Raphael insisted that the world was nothing else than events and their causal relations we add that we insist that energy and momentum transmitted between events across the causal relations are also real and fundamental. So if we put if we put in that and nothing else, what emerges from it? And we'll show, and I'll show you a little bit of this here, how space, space-time fields, particles, their interactions, and so forth, all emerge once you put in the events, the causal relations, and their energy and momentum. And so we will formulate laws of physics in terms only of those fundamental things as well. Now, since there's no space, there's no distance between points, there's no um, fields, there's no derivatives. So what can there be that we, we study like physicists by studying with laws and how they change things? Well, the only thing we can study is this difference between the views 
of an event. So the view of an event is a fundamental thing for us. A view of an event is, imagine, you're, we have, first of all, a classical picture. In the classical world, we have events, and we have their light cones, which are information coming to those events from the past. And we have light cones that go into the future. And we are going to chop off the, the, the second kind and consider only the light cones going to the past as real. So this uh, this is information of a different kind, which is coming up to each event, and an observer at that event can know something about their past from the views that they see there. So we're going to measure and talk about relations between the views of events and construct all of our dynamics from just relationships between views. And we'll see that that's enough. So, so we're going to need one quantity like energy that plays a role in this dynamics of events. And we call this quantity the variety. And what it basically is, is an average over all the events that exist at one time of the differences between their views. That is, we imagine that we ask every pair of views that exist then to evaluate how different each one is from the, all the others. That's a quantity called the variety. And we'll see that maximizing the variety is exactly what we need to insert the dynamics of particles and fields and gauge fields and so forth. Okay, so I think I've said everything. Yeah. Um, so, Lee, if I may uh, just interrupt, there's a request from the participants that uh, if you could just come a little closer to the microphone so that uh, your voice is clear and loud. Thank you. I apologize for that. Okay. So let me back off a little bit and just talk about what I am philosophically. So I am very much a realist. I am a, within the classes of people who are realists. I'm a relationalist. That is, I think that everything that's real is a relation. And I'm very much a Leibnizian relation, relationalist. Within that, um, it's very temporal. That is, I believe that the only things that are real are characterizations of how things change. So let's see what that implies. That implies that the universe contains everything that is the case. There's nothing outside or apart from the universe. And this puts me right away at a distance from, unfortunately, all my friends and colleagues in cosmology who talk about ADS this and ADS that. And it's beautiful stuff mathematically, but it's got nothing to do with cosmology as the study of a real universe. So um, we're going to associate measurements and consciousness with some aspects of the cosmological states. But you'll see that the important thing is only some aspects. Okay. Like I said, everything else here. I'm happy to be interrupted in a better way. Otherwise, I'm going to keep going. So, to summarize, we have in our universe no fundamental objects. We have viewables, but viewables are actions. An event in our looking at it is an action, it's a change from one thing to another thing. And in that change, energy and momentum are transferred from the incoming to the outgoing. So time is the process which can simply brings into being novel events as a result of an event receiving some energy and momentum from some past events. The role of an event, but the point of an event is its view which is what it knows about the causal past. There's the information coming to it from the from its past. And the emergent properties of the world, like space and space-time, are basically the properties left behind momentarily as we make this motion from, past, from future to present to past. And you, you know, that may be backwards in how you think, so let me just take a moment for that. If, if there is in the future some events that may happen, we describe it by a wave function. 
We don't know which events will happen, definitely. And that's the role of wave functions, is by the way Heisenberg insisted to us. And when the event happens, it's in the present, it happens in the present, and some things get defined. The things that get defined, like basically what measurements are made, what properties are established, are fixed and fixed into the past. So the way to look at the world this way is that the future is coming to us. We are receiving the information from the future states and turning it into definite qualities, which are the past states. Okay, do you have that? And that's this. With this background, we can go a little bit further. Um, any question at this point? Okay, well, let me just say you can go develop this quite a bit into the future. And we did so with Marina Cortez. And um, let me maybe skip the detailed evolution of these things. But um, the important thing is that there are conservation laws. So uh, these Ps are the energy and momentum being carried from a past event to a future event. And they they can change as they travel, which is parallel transport, and that gives us general relativity. And so we go on. Okay. So I'm going to skip a lot of this because I want I know you want to get to consciousness um, but this is sort of a summary how how this view of the universe works and maybe we'll come back to it if people are interested I'm just repeating the things that we said in different ways um, this has to do with well, let me just leave that okay so we want to add to this picture of the world an interaction and the interaction is as in all physics. See, this is really a copy of, I'm really stealing from basically how Newton and Leibniz and other people constructed models of dynamics. What you need is some kinetic energy part. And from our point of view, that measures the changes of views as we move in from past events to future events. Potential energy has to do with energy inherent in the present observables, which are, again, the views. And if we count how different each view's past is from the other views, we have the quantity we call variety. And so systems in ordinary classical physics, it's basically the bottom line is that systems are more likely to interact with other systems that are closer to them in space or space-time. And we are jettisoning that and talking about systems that are more likely to interact because they are more similar or more different to each other. They appear more similar or more different. So that's what we, we make what's called the dynamics of difference, which is the study of systems that are peering at each other, looking at, looking at the different contributions each one makes to the past views of the other ones, and studying how those functions evolve. Okay. Now, um, where am I on time? Anybody want to give me a... You have 20 more minutes. There is no I'm future. Sure. Don't worry. <laughs> okay. Okay. I, I hope I didn't lose everybody. So these are now emergences, how these different things emerge. And I think I won't give much detail, but just to, to, just to say that we have detailed mathematical descriptions of how space and space-time emerge and how particles moving in those space-times emerge. Um, and let, me, let me skip. Well, the important thing is to say that we do things like everybody else. We write path integrals, but our path integrals have no function of h-bar because they have only momentum, no position, no space-time, no commutation relations, no uncertainty principles. So these are all quantities that emerge dynamically as our systems evolve. 
and we can show you as much of that as you like. Um, we introduce, this is again for the expert, we introduce constraints which express the conservation laws. We put those in the action in the usual way, and we get out space of some dimension, and we get out equations of motion and interactions between particles. And let me just show you enough of it that you can see that we're doing something interesting. Now, I, I want to focus in on the quantity I call variety because it's sort of the opposite of what we think about when we think about entropy. In entropy, we basically look for to um, maximize differences and maximize, sorry, um, randomness. And therefore, what we look for in an equilibrium is systems that are maximally random, maximally uninteresting. When we maximize variety, on the other hand, we're looking for every pair of particles to have a maximum difference in how what it sees when it looks around the universe. And there's some pictures of models of these. And when you get high variety, you get systems that are very interesting because every subsystem in them is different. So you can see they look differently than the equilibrium ensembles, which are maximal when everything is boring. So these are some measurements we made by with various collecting. Okay, so this is a picture of a maximal variety set. And you can see that if you look, to, if you take any two pairs of subsets, they're different, they're highly different. And that's what we want to make the world out of. So um, let me let me turn from that just to say that we realize that whole program all the way from particle physics to something that looks a lot like general relativity. And now we want to understand why qualia comes in. So um the the point is that we want to recognize that there are two kinds of physical interactions. There are physical interactions in quantum theory, which are repetitions of what has already trans transpired over and over again. And those are the lawful aspects of quantum mechanics. But then there are quantum systems where they, well, well, let's say it this way. The first type of quantum system, we might say, is a precedented quantum system, or a quantum system with lots of precedents. So rather than giving it Hamiltonian, we can just say that when you look at this kind of quantum system, if you look at its past, you will have many, if you look at its past, you will have many systems, subsystems, which resemble the system in all its basic quantities, basic defining quantities. And so you have an ensemble, and you can just look at the ensemble and tell where the next part, the next experiment will go. If you, in other words, if you are doing an experiment that is much precedent, you don't have to know what's Hamiltonian, you just have to look at the ensemble as generated as it evolved and pick responses to the world out of that ensemble. So most of the time when we're doing quantum theory, we're really just counting precedents. But sometimes there are no precedents to a uh, given initial conditions or initial state. And we have to look out into a universe which gives the system no precedent to tell us how it should evolve or tell the system how it should evolve. And these are systems without precedent. And these, the universe has to kind of make it up. And we want to insist that these second kind of precedents are what's going on every time a part of the universe it must, quote, collapse its wave function or go from indefinite to definite states. Remember, I mentioned that would be important. 
And there, these systems contain guesses, they contain aspects which can invent the future, not just follow laws, but invent laws. And so we call these unprecedented quantum systems. And the basic idea is that qualia are related to unprecedented quantum systems. Qualia are what the world must do to choose a future when there is no precedent. And that's why qualia is important. We are at the beginning of the universe and in situations where there is no simple direction or instruction to the universe for what to do. Okay, so that's the that's the one idea I have about consciousness. And we can add to that, we can express that in hypotheses. The first is, as I was saying, that there are in quantum theory two very different kinds of events, precedented events and unprecedented events. Ordinary, we can also think of these in terms of novel quantum systems or regular quantum systems. Regular quantum systems, again, know how to evolve by looking around at the rest of the universe. Unprecedented quantum systems don't get a clue and therefore must have an ability to invent partly their future. Routine events are those which can be described to a good approximation by ordinary quantum mechanics, and those that dominate this world most of the time. That's why quantum physics works most of the time. Novel events will require a realist, indefinite completion and definition of quantum physics. These are then associated with the completion of quantum mechanics. Only views of novel or unique events, which have no precedence or copies, are correlates of conscious perception. That is, our idea is that, is to repeat it, when the universe knows how to evolve, knows where it's going by looking around in its past, then you get nothing. That's ordinary physics. When the universe must discover in itself a capacity to change, then that's when we get qualia, and that's when we also get the universe contributing to its own evolution. And finally, very often there's a kind of one-dimensional order one can put such systems in, and that's why qualia for us always have one-dimensional orders that they're working out. Now, let me just um, say something in summary. Um, it seems when you when you lean back, really wild to think that, well, let's examine several of the hypotheses I made here. That there's a level of dynamics where there's no distance, there's no space or quantities that are dependent on space. And instead, the universe has potential energy and kinetic energy relative to change in the appearance. And this is a really wild idea, but spend some time thinking about how else you might do it. And I was stunned recently to discover that Leibniz, in fact, had a, one of his models of monads that worked exactly that way. Um, second, we have the idea of a universe that can choose its laws as it's evolved. And again, before you think that's ridiculous, think of how else you would do it, how else you would make a universe which is ordered completely internally with no object from the outside influencing it or vice versa. And this is the only way I think these I've found that one can have a universe that works out, which is to have a universe that has no definite laws, but develops the laws. And just to make a little um, side glance to, um, we recently have been working recently, the last two or four years, with the computer scientist Jared Lanier and making models of universes using the various new tools people have now. Um, and we've been having some interesting results which we developed and we call the universe 
inventing itself as it appears. And again, if you think that's crazy, try to invent an alternative. Thanks very much. I think that. Thank you very much for that thought provoking presentation. Uh, yes. So, uh, I, I, what I would do now is uh, announce the poll results. There were two questions just to remind everyone. Uh, one was, could qualia and consciousness be playing a role on quantum scales? 68% uh, of the participants answered yes and 32% answered no. Uh, the second uh, question was, do we need consciousness to play a role at the beginning of the universe? Uh, surprising for me is uh, that 36, only 36% answered this question is yes and 64% as no. Uh, so thank you very much, everyone, for participating in this. I'm going to share the results, so I hope uh, you will be able to see uh, the results on your screen. I just remind also everyone to post their questions that they might have in the Q&A box, which you will be able to see at the bottom of your Zoom window. Uh, so, um, be, yes, Lee. Maybe a little provocative uh, in terms of the second question. If you are somebody who thinks that the beginning of the universe doesn't require something which is outside of normal physics to make it happen, just try to come up with something with it. It's bad enough you have to think about a universe sitting there forever, waiting to Big Bang. That's already an absurd idea. And add to that the idea that there's nothing that can make the bang bang, so to speak. Um, and what? how do we, how does the universe choose which are its laws at that point? If it doesn't, it's not given some capacity to invent them itself. Thank you for that, Lee. Uh, so while the questions are flowing in, I'm going to request Christophe. Do you have anything to say yourself or have a question? Uh, yeah, with respect to the the last the six hypotheses that that you left on the the, the slide, uh, Lee. So you mm -hmm. say in each sense, so vision, sound, smell, touch, uh, etc. Call you have a one dimensional order. I don't understand what you're referring to. So, for instance, color typically has three dimensions, right? There are all sorts of yeah. color spaces, but all of them incorporate three dimensions. Smells probably incorporate a thousand dimension. Taste is at least five different uh, dimensions. So what do you mean by one-dimensional order for the qualia? I mean that I have to work <laughs> I, 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 I... I, I have to say that those um, dimensions are not as fundamental as some others that we might still discover. But I agree that that's a weak point. That's really why I put it there. I'm not going to try it very hard. You know these issues much more than, much better than I do. But there has let, let me. Um, Is how well, let me ask the back of you. It's, how do you understand the idea that the universe, that the laws fundamentally have many different um, dimensions, and how would you display that or construct uh, a model of it? I mean, for me, the qualia arises the fact. I mean, let me back up. I think there are two fundamental problems that, to, to explain if, you, if you're dealing with consciousness. One is, why is there any consciousness at all? But then, as you point out, qualia, why does space feel extended? Why does time feel, whether it's an illusion or not, it's different, but feels to be flowing? Why does, you know, color have this particular, you know, you have things called shoe? Uh, why do objects feel the way they do? And I think ultimately that arises out of the causal interaction of the of of uh, of the system, which which is what, what slightly different. Of, what, what the, was the, the word? System. No, the what interaction, color interaction. 
you know, the, the interactions of the system that constitutes your, your conscious system, whether it's a brain or whether it's a simple quantum system, that system, each of these systems have causal interactions, you know, it's dictated by, by, you know, the, the relevant laws of physics. And out of these causal interactions has to arise. So you have to sort of unfold the causal power from the, from the fundamental constituents a part of your of your of your system, whether that's a brain or a computer or any other system. Um, okay, I I see that, and I I certainly it's formidable, but there is for me it's a, you're not describing physics unless you have energy as your most fundamental observable, and so I want to knock everything down to energy if I can. And that's my self yeah. not very to, to do that. Yeah, I don't know about that. All I know that qualia, you know, is not uh, at least the way we for, for loss us or what we refer to as qualia, the feeling of something, you know, whether I'm bored or excited or in love or in mushrooms, those are all different qualia. I I I don't I don't think they can be reduced to a one dimensional you know, a one dimensional uh, variable. Okay. I mean, to so what that, extent is there one dimension? If I feel in love, which is a qualia, a conscious state, how, how can, what, what, what one dimensional does this vary? The intensity of my love for, for the object that I love or I, two know, it's, a, it's, it's an excellent question. And I, well, for me, love is wonderful, but it's very complicated. So I, I wouldn't try to. I, I'm, no, I agree, and I'm not advocating for a research program on love. All I'm saying, love as an example of pain, you know, when you have the you have a molar, you have a tooth that's really painful, that's, you know, how, I mean, I don't see how that can be described by one, you know, by one, by one variable, you know, yes, well, a one-dimensional uh, order. I, so let me... I mean, that's my only objection. Yes, let me accept that and look forward to more discussion on. Okay. Thank you, Lee and uh, Christoph. Uh, there is a question from Akantiji Das that I would like to, uh, I would like Lee to address, uh, and he asks, uh, 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 "How does one relate energy to qualia? What do you see as the energy of qualia? If that makes sense." Yeah, so that's the, that's another question, which is just like the previous one. And the answer is the way you write down the energy of anything. You just guess and write a formula which connects some things that you can measure to some things that you can't measure. And presumably, if it works, your hypothesis becomes a way of defining and measuring that quantity. So that's not, I know that's not very helpful. But that's what I aim to do. Okay, and another question he asks is, uh, with reference to uh, the point that you made just uh, about the need for qualia to be available at the start uh, in order to choose the initial direction of the universe. Uh, so Akhandi Didas again asks, uh, is there a missing point of origin for qualia in terms of initiating the new laws of the universe uh, by which it then unfolds? Um, I'm just sort of pointing to the possibility. You, the question we want to know, we cosmologists want to know, is what on what basis does the universe choose its initial states? And we're trying out the hypothesis of the idea that it, there is a real nature of choice, and we're not, we're dealing with something in the world of choice. And that's really all we're doing. We're trying to model that kind of dynamics, where you can imagine a part of the world chooses how it interacts or how it understands the input from another part of the world. Um, let me just mention that Leibniz is always helpful to me here at this point. Leibniz talks about, for example, a beautiful um, meditation 
I feel as he talks about, think of when you're describing a city, think of all the different ways of seeing the city from all the different points of view. And that helps you see how multiple points of view can work together to influence the system to evolve and change. And that I find helpful. It's not complete, but it's, um, there's, a, there's often it seems like Leibniz is, is, is using a metaphor. And somehow if you look at it a little more closely, it seems like there's a little bit more than a metaphor there. But I don't claim to know how to answer any of these questions. Okay, uh, there are a couple of uh, participants who ask, uh, do your hypotheses make any predictions that could be tested experimentally and how? Not yet. So I know, no. But, but we would love to be able to do that. Well, that's always the big question is how do we experimentally study this and... Uh, um, sure. validate theory, right? So uh, maybe you have another paper in the making <laughs> that'll tell us how to do that. Uh, all right, so here's another question uh, by uh, Dobrika uh, Jovanovic, if I spelled that correctly, uh, if I pronounced that correctly, but uh, she says, uh, I enjoyed the lecture very much. If I understand correctly, we assume that there is intrinsic distinction between past and so to say the future in this theory. I wondered what is your opinion on time direction emergence in general? Uh, should we try to even think about it? Well, I think Roger Penrose thinks about it. I think it, it is, you know, there's, there's, the question is where does the arrow of time come from? And the most, most working cosmologists Imagine that the laws are going to be time symmetric initially, and there's a kind of emergence, there's something, some kind of symmetry breaking in, a preference for one direction versus another direction of time emerges. And I, I think it's worth studying models of that. Um, I'm interested in a different kind of model where it just intrinsically is a big difference between looking into the past and looking into the future. It saves, for one thing, it saves you a lot of work because it's actually pretty hard to get the universe to have a phase transition that works well enough to first uh, a splitting between the past and the future to come out cleanly enough to be useful. Right. Um, so uh, there is another question by Shriyas Gokhale. Uh, I know he's from MIT. Uh, about the novelty and uh, consciousness part of your talk. Uh, he asks, would you consider new images generated by artificial intelligence as instances of novelty? And if so, would that imply that current neural networks are conscious? Just your take on it, I suppose. My take on it is, um, is undecided. I, uh, so I, and I think given the expertise in the room probably exceeds mine greatly. I'm, I'm very impressed by what the, the language models that people are playing with can do, of course, but I'm also very impressed by what they can't do. They can tell, I'm told the joke, but they can't tell you why the joke is funny. Um, and I think there's a lot to learn in the looking at, looking at what they can do easily and what they can't do easily. But I think there's, I mean, I, I personally don't, think that they're, quote, conscious. But I think that that's, it's too, it's early, early days. And there are going to be certainly surprises along the way. Excellent. I have one question, which is with regards to the orchestrated objective reduction theory that Roger Penrose and Stuart Hameroff have. Um, which is related to one of the questions here, but uh, I'll give you my version of it, is that uh, they refer to qualia as um, some kinds of uh, uh, curvatures of space and time, and that the perception of this uh, qualia or the experience of that qualia itself uh, 
comes about from the collapse of the wave function and uh, uh, all this uh, quantum mechanics happening in the microtubules of brains. So according to your theory, I mean, is uh, what is the process by which we as or, or these uh, biological systems uh, facilitate the experience of qualia? Boy, that's a hard question. I mean, I, I think that's the only thing to say. Um, and, um, you know, Roger and colleagues, Ideas are interesting. I don't think they're final. I think there's a long way to go if that indeed is something like the right direction. Um, I, th I think the brain is amazingly interesting, and I'm trying a little bit, obviously, to study that. And um, you know, I myself am a cyborg, and there are some interesting questions that raise. But boy, is there a long way to go. Okay, I think we'll end with one final question, which is uh, uh, very much related with the theme of our series, which is consciousness and reality. Is uh, uh, do you what what according to you is consciousness, and uh, uh, is reality made for conscious beings like us? Um, I think that I mean these. Are... From my point of view, consciousness, the important thing of my proposal, relating it to the uh, you know, a little bit earlier proposals, is I'm a panpsychist, but in very narrow spaces. Because I'm only interested in panpsychism being a way to describe the world in this small proportion of the world that I pointed out had to do or might have to do with um, selection of laws, um, non, non, um, non principle of words. And um, I think that that's, it's a proposal to examine for those people who are interested in ideas like panpsychism. Because imagining that everything, quote, is conscious to me, doesn't give me, it doesn't tell me what to do next. But I really, really want to emphasize that my ideas are very tentative, and I'm just trying to get started in some direction that's useful. It might turn out to be useful. I would like to thank Lee Smolin again, our speaker, Christoph Koch, uh, and to all participants and everyone who made this event happen. Have a great day. Thank you again. Thank you very, very much. Thank you, both Christoph and Lee.